Um, also simulating pretty normal things. We started to get really interested in streets and frustrated about streets at this point because we wanted to affect the streets that make these traffic islands. We wanted to affect the crossings. Uh, we were not able to because of you know, contractual reasons. We also wanted there to be a building frontage on the site and wanted there to be buildings on this park, but we weren't allowed to because of master planning commitments. And so we basically simulated as best we can. We simulated the feeling of having building frontage and shelter and prospect and refuge um, with, this, with this pergola. Um, and then uh, at the same time, we are also realizing that on many of our projects, the biggest, best move could be found by looking at work that other people have done. And um, I mentioned this earlier as almost a cheater move that we figured out at one point that um, many of the cities we worked in were beautifully planned at one point and had a wonderful pedestrian, a network of pedestrian spaces that worked for human beings on foot. And a lot of the sites we were coming into had become missing links and to make them vibrant again, we could try to totally reinvent the wheel and tell, them, tell people everything we're doing is new and innovative, it's the newest, latest, greatest. But we'd often find the answer when we look back at these historic plans, whether it's Olmsted, Burnham, Lanfon. Um, so many cities in the US had a great structure at one point. And so we're often putting pieces back, um, looking for, you know, where, is this, where did this come from? Why is this a missing piece in the city? And, can we rely on a framework that's already there and hook into that and get a bigger win for the city out of what we do rather than trying to come up with some like new fancy object that's gonna photograph well and draw people there. So some of our work, as you'll see, is a little quiet when you look at it in photographs. So what do they do? Um, because we just put things back that probably should have been there all along. Um, so you have to have a certain kind of personality that wants to work in an office where half your work, people will say, did you do anything? It's a nice space, but what did you guys do? Um, this is Cleveland, um, downtown Cleveland, the only white city that was actually made, uh, built out of the City Beautiful movement. Um, this is sort of like a court of honor. Um, amazing space, but it had gotten really broken up over the years with these huge arterials um, breaking up this magnificent mall. And this is an example of, we really came into the project to make sure that no further damage would be done and that um, we're sort of spokespeople for, for Burnham and Carrere and his group um, to try to bring the order and continuity back to the malls. <coughs> and we've also found a lot of gratification um, in the office uh, working on uh, sidewalks. Um, you know, one of the things we're frustrated with, and especially once you develop that eye to see what simple things are missing in our pedestrian network and in the structure of our cities that used to be there. We really just wanna put them back everywhere we, we can. So we do have a series of projects um, where we work with architect or developer friends on sidewalks. And those get, don't get published a lot, but they're tremendously rewarding um, because you take a street that felt like a place that no one wanted to walk and it was just one-sided and it becomes two-sided. Um, and you just see people behaving in a different way um, and it creates this kind of domino effect that's really powerful, almost more so, I would argue, than what you can often do with a standalone um, hyper-specialized park space <coughs> or programmed um, open space. Uh, and that has led to just like really graphically kind of ugly <laughs> slide um, of this kind of work where we have become really interested in traffic engineering and trying to understand that um, partly out of, well, why can't the sidewalk be two feet wider? Why can't the crosswalk actually align with the way people are walking um, across the um, intersection? And um, spin-offs on our other projects, because we got involved in those adjacent crossings and intersections, we've ended up getting um, involved in roadway projects. So this is the Gates Foundation campus here. Um, massive roadway projects. This is, a, a, you know, massive um, changes around the site. And we're involved in this arterial widening project that um, probably won't get a design excellence award. Um, but our, our role on that has really been to go to meetings and be sort of pedestrian engineers and care about the pedestrian, what the pedestrian movement is um, through the project. And in doing so, we're learning a lot from our traffic engineer friends about um, the way that streets are designed now. And, and you need to sort of get your sleeves rolled up and understand the way things work now 
to be credible and trying to change them. So it's been a good experience for the office so far. And that has led into now, um, we're doing master plans for streets. Um, this is downtown Seattle. This is called the Pike Pine Renaissance Plan. And I'll briefly touch on this um, in the rest of the slides. Um, so Lurie Garden, I mentioned earlier, um, it was, um, or I, I, remind, I might have mentioned earlier today <laughs> that it was the project that basically launched our office. Um, it was a competition. We weren't really sure even that we sh did they know they invited us because there was it was an invited competition and, and amazing people were on the list and it was right after we started the office. Um, but we uh, entered it and miraculously um, we won. But the way that this formed our design process kind of stuck with us. Uh, none of us had been to Chicago. Um, we couldn't afford to fly there to go see the site for the competition. So that made me panic and just start to read everything I could about Chicago and do a lot of research. Um, even just random, anything I could get my hands on. Um, this was year 2000. And then we collaborated with people who did know their stuff. And that's another thing we continue to do is just collaborate with architects, collaborate with um, people who are experts. Um, in their fields and we learn from them. So Pete Udolf and Bob Israel, who's a theater set designer. Bob, actually we worked with him at that opera promenade I showed you before because he was designing the interior and we just really clicked with him. Um, and then um, Pete is famous for his um, new perennial design work. Um, he hadn't done anything in the US at this point and um, it was a real symbiotic relationship. So this was the, these were the site photos we got, which we were really excited to get a CD of site photos, because at that point you couldn't have done that electronically. And um, they were just shoot when we got these, because it didn't say a lot about the landscape character of the site. And the project brief for this competition was do a botanical garden that represents the landscape of Chicago. So I was on this mission to figure out well, what is the landscape of Chicago? What's their gardening tradition there? What, what, you know, how do people identify with it? In doing that, I was on this wild goose chase that taught me about everything but that, but I learned all about the architectural history of Chicago, and I looked at a lot of old maps that made me realize, well, actually, this site photo does tell us something about what our concept's gonna be for this botanical garden. This site was built up from being literally dozens of feet deep of water on the marshy edge of what was this huge marsh, a really weird place to build a city. Um, and just a place that European explorers just complained about because it was mucky and they had to canoe through it and the plants, you know, they couldn't see farther than a few feet away. Um, and it was built up and built up and built up. And then um, now Chicago is one of the most architecturally defined, precise, high and dry, big grid places you could find in the world. And so that contrast between like the ultra mucky, ultra organic, ultra inconvenient landscape to being this super engineered place that was the birth of the high rise and all of that. Um, we thought that's gonna be the story that we're gonna tell with this landscape. Um, and we read all about, I read all about, I read a biography of a mayor who ran on the platform of raising the city four feet. Um, and he won, everyone's like, we're gonna raise the whole city. Um, so it was all about building up. And then we discovered, and then the other thing, so I'll just mention briefly, um, this was what we got from the client about the rest of Millennium Park. And one of the tough things is having a landscape that's trying to compete with objects that are gonna be shiny and perfect when they're built and they're three dimensional. So we wanted to make this landscape a little bit of a massive object um, as well as being a space. Um, so here's what the site looked like when we um, were working on this. It was a rail yard and you can kind of see there's this diagonal line here. Um, that is actually the old edge of the lake and it goes right through our site and I started finding this on old maps and then and I was talking about this earlier today with some of the classes there's that moment you do all this research for us you know it's sort of this insecurity we want to make sure we don't do something inappropriate or ill-informed about a place we've never been to before so we research and research and research and then you think well what am I going to do with all this data it's not graphic necessarily which do I choose to express but it really just got down to this <laughs> Um, drawing, which this is the actual drawing, um, I think done as a, on a plane or something, but um, it was, okay, here's the bottom of Frank Gehry's lawn here. Here's our site, and it was just, people are going to experience the original and the new um, Chicago landscape and get an understanding of this incredible transformation. So originally we called this the wet and the dry plate, but the wet being you're wading through plants, 
and it's sort of scary, and then the dry being you, the human, are king of a totally controlled landscape. So how do we turn that into a form? These are all the drawings. These are small. I still, you know, especially at the beginning of the project, we encourage people to draw on really small pieces of paper, so you're only thinking about the big body and the big lines and getting that figured out before you get distracted by little details. So these are, these are like this big, you know, six by six. Um, except for this one. This is a, that, believe it or not, was our competition graphic submittal that won the competition. So good job on the client for using their faith on that one. Um, uh, so here's how we turned into a landform. Overall, it's this swollen object. It's really muscular. It feels almost like it's been punched up from below. It's this sort of rising up life. Um, and then there's two right on the sort of angle of the old shoreline. We have the old wet and the new dry. Here, um, you're cutting through, and the land and the plants are above you, so you feel sort of small. Here, your, your path is putting you higher and higher in relation to the land. You have this high point that you can see out to the lake. And then we use this hedge to control our horizon, so you wouldn't be trying, we wouldn't be trying to, people to get people to be wowed by plants, but then they see the bean, like, you know, a block away. It would be really hard. So we cropped out everything. Um, that's sort of that medium scale, but we really wanted to relate to the skyline, to say Chicago is about big, bold, we were using the wall of the loop around um, Millennium Park and that extruded look that it has, and then we're sort of saying you're standing in the prairie and you're looking at this city raising out of the prairie. Um, some more of the graphics. Um, so that's sort of the effect, you know, this was the image I started on, of course. Um, but we, we just wanted to almost falsely put these things against each other, which meant for the prairie thing, we wanted to really make it pure and big. Um, and we couldn't have a weak, you know, a bunch of weak planters. We wanted to feel like you're being allowed into this big ground. So this gives you a sense. This is before the shoulder hedge grew in. But those paths are just put down, put into the land enough that people really feel like they're sort of slicing through. And then the detailing is all about, we want it to look like this land sort of cleaved up. And so everything that's on a vertical is smooth, as if it's been sliced. Everything's on a horizontal is rough, as if it was all one plane at some point before that upward movement happened. And then, of course, we're always in our work, if you look closely at it, we're finding all sorts of ways to avoid rails. <laughs> so we break down, you know, we get the form, and then we break down the edges so that it's occupiable, which is really what this is about on the... Um, boardwalk as well. The whole thing is tilted 4% toward the Art Institute across the street, which wasn't designed yet at that point. Um, and this is about breaking down that edge. Totally counterintuitive. People have their back to the walkway, but we really beefed up the wheelchair stop. It's about three times its width in the end um, detail, and people are comfortable sitting there. Um, sometimes those necessities of like figuring out how to avoid a rail or figure out a grading problem will give you some interesting place to put the human body that people wouldn't, you wouldn't have otherwise thought of and people might not experience anywhere else. Um, so then there's this other kind of project that's going on um, in parallel to that, um, which is sort of the city repairing projects. This is in Washington, D.C. Um, it's the old convention center site. And this project just got built. It's called City Center DC. Heinz was the client, a wonderful developer. Uh, we did this as a competition with Foster and Partners. And this was the competition design. And you'll see a lot of differences. Here, the architects are you know, really driving with making sure the forms of the buildings are charismatic. Competition winning designs are often different than what you do to just do the right thing. It's kind of an interesting balance. Um, but look at how different it ended up being. And the reason why is we realized this is a super block. It's kind of tough to walk around there. We started looking at the um, historic site, and it had this wonderful hierarchy of streets and lanes and alleys and courts. And we also worked with a company called Space Syntax, who sort of analyzes um, retail viability. And the interesting thing was if we put this grid back and let the building support streets rather than the building being an object in a monument plaza, we actually got better retail activation, and um, we thought we got a more interesting site, even though would this have won the competition? I don't know. Um, 
Uh, the other thing we're doing here is putting back one of the bow ties, the L'Enfant bow ties. So this, sorry about my shaky hand. Um, this is a bow tie that's in, you'll see it's like symmetrical. There's these sort of squares that are made up of two triangles um, in the plan. And so we sort of extracted that and wanted to put that back and at the very least um, not build on it so that it could be fully fitted out again in the future as this stopping space. That's a really good point. Um, so here's... It's, it's huge development. Um, just got built. These are pictures showing it before some of the streets are open. But there's a mixture of vehicle streets, pedestrian streets, mixed-use streets um, moving through. It's kind of a dreamy project because it was a wonderful client. There was a, a, a healthy budget to put into the quality of the streets. And then here's that Bowtie Plaza. So even here, though, we did have some fun and created sort of the signature object. This is a park and a water feature that is kind of hard to explain quickly, but um, we, it's um, sort of a paperless design, and we did models in the office, figuring out how the water could be laminar over something that would look very irregular, and then it's CNC milled stone um, that's sort of, uh, you know, just taking that surface down at the edges, and so, so people can see the water when they're um, coming from the side. A lot of modeling collaboration with, um, Cold Springs granted on that. So here's the project I showed you earlier, uh, Foster and Partners um, roof, and it was controversial. Um, this is at the Patton Office Building, which now houses the National Portrait Gallery in DC, and I encourage you to go to that museum if you haven't been yet, it's free. Um, it's a really important place in the L'Enfant Plan. Um, when we arrived on the scene, on the project, this is what the site looked like. But the, if you see in the inset, the, there was a real controversy because a green space was being taken out. And we often arrive on the scene when there's a controversy <laughs> that we need to solve, especially if historic sensitivity is involved. So um, people were asking for greenery, but it was inside, and there was art underneath and only a few inches of depth. So we couldn't put super deep soil in. So Foster and Partners asked if we could come in and design some kind of movable planter. Um, so that there'd be like trees that would sort of satisfy the people looking for greenery, but they could be moved out when there was a event, because this was going to be used for balls and things like that. The inaugural ball um, happens here, one of them does. Um, this is what we ended up doing. Um, we felt like small, tall planters would look silly. Um, against this Greek Revival architecture and this massive field, seamless field, spacey, seamless field of a roof. So we wanted to stretch out what we were doing. And we also really wanted to lower the planters down so they were sleeker and so you could sit on them. You wouldn't be looking at yucky planter walls when you're in the space. But to lower them down, we had to find locations where they would never have to move. And at first it was like, no, they have to move because they're going to be ballrooms. But we studied and studied and studied the arrangement of the catering and the tables, looked at every scenario, and found places where we could have to press these planters to get the soil we needed um, for the trees. Um, this gives you a sense. Um, this is just looking at the different programming spaces we analyzed. Um, because we were inside, we were able to do a 1% slope on that water scrim, which we'd never do outside. Um, and you can see those low-slung planters, because they were on structure, we're on a rooftop here, as we are in most of our work, they couldn't be as solid as they looked. We made them out of the same marble that the steps and floors are made out of. It's from Georgia, inside the museum. Um, but we wanted them to look really grounded and almost like they were sort of barges going through or like bars of soap. So the rounded language you see is all this sort of trying to tie all these small hollow pieces of stone veneer together into a bigger form so that you notice the bigger form first. And then this joint hierarchy that you see, this, these are actually sort of rounded pillowed joints. We actually made these joints much bigger than they needed to be so that you see that there's pieces in the stone, but you kind of think, oh, there's this big, big assembly that's kind of smooshed together. Um, before you start to notice these smaller joints that were necessary. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but um, it kind of helped with that. Uh, Cleveland, this is in some ways a, um, one of our first, first do no harm projects. 
um, where when we explain what we did, we tried to make sure that a beautiful historic plan didn't get lost when a lot of changes were being made to a space. Barnum Carrere, the group plan, um, amazing project if you get a chance to um, look at it. And again, the only like fantasy white city court of honor that was actually built in the United States. And it took Cleveland until 1940, but they built it. They built these buildings every other decade. They build a building or two. Um, a grand idea for this mall that would center the downtown um, city beautiful at its finest. So this is as far as they got with it, 1940s, late 40s. And then what happened? Parking garages um, and convention center expansions went underneath the malls. There's ramps, there's um, major one-way arterials. The only way to get here was to do, you're like, this is like the scariest crosswalk, I'd, one of the scariest I've ever been in. Um, and the city, when we got <coughs> to this project, called this mall A, mall B, and mall C. Like if you asked them where the mall was, they're like, well, which shopping mall are you going to? Like, oh, you mean Mall A, Mall B, or Mall C? Which made us really sad, because it should be the mall. So um, they were ripping this all up to put a new convention center underneath. And it had to pop up somewhere to get more ceiling height, because convention centers need to be like 33 or 34 high, uh, foot high ceilings. So we worked with the architects LMN to help them, um, help kind of advise them on where the pop-up could be that would be the least injurious to people's potential read of this as a grand promenade. And it seems kind of out of sync, like why would you do this grand monument today when people are looking for informal urban living? But we had this idea that um, this would be this grand monument, it'd be beautiful, but it's a place you can walk your dog, which is kind of like what the National Mall has become. Um, but we've had to design it on two levels. One is the first do no harm, put the roof back, that's what the budget's for, or the, that's what the budget covers. And then there's a master plan that um, a new, newly reconvened group plan commission in Cleveland is raising money to complete that will actually add that next level of horticulture and texture and livability into the space. And harsh reality, this is what it looks like right now. The roof was built, concrete and turf, making sure it doesn't go in the wrong place, but it, it's a uh, pretty huge site right now. <laughs> Um, and this is the vision for fully getting fully planted out. We've built in all the soil depths everywhere they need to be. We just didn't have the money to put the plants in yet and, and other things. So this is the campaign going on in Cleveland. And it really is an out, the whole group district and the reconvening of the group plan mission was a result of us being brought in to advise on this roof of a convention center and realizing, oh my gosh, you guys are sitting on a gold mine here. This is a Burnham mall, this is monumental, I'm from the west coast, that stuff just floors me. And sometimes you come in, you're like, I don't know anything about this, but it's so cool. You can get people so excited um, and really just sort of start something that maybe you're not even involved in later, but you're glad that the opportunity wasn't missed. So let's see, I have time to maybe do one more project. Gates Foundation, this just won a Design Excellence Award, uh, which we're <coughs> really humbled by. Um, it is in sort of on the edge of downtown Seattle here. The whole thing is actually a building. That's one of the things I tell people from the outset. Um, it is a giant building. There's parking, mechanical stuff, et cetera, underneath. Um, the interesting thing about this project, it was an eight-year process, and when we first started working with the foundation, they were, they're so humble, um, and their culture is so much about that and focused on their grantees that they didn't even really have a way to articulate who they were to help us understand what kind of language we'd use for the campus. So it was an amazing fly on the wall experience that you will have as a designer working with your clients to help them identify themselves. Because you'll just learn so much about these interesting organizations. So this is this um, sort of boring from, from uh, graphically um, chart that we worked on with the NBBJ, the architects to identify the values of this foundation. And basically, when we started the project, it was all about humble and mindful. Quiet, careful, collaborative, don't make you know, any kind of statement that, that, that's um, too sort of self-focused. Um, but as by the end of the eight years, there was this realization, we need to inspire people as well. So it was this balance between those two things. The site had historically been a bog, and as it was when we started the project, it was this giant 12-acre parking lot that was shooting polluted water into Lake Union. So um, we came up with this concept that the site would become this gentle sponge 
and would not shoot any more water into the um, sewer system. How do you make a sponge out of a rooftop was sort of <laughs> something we got ourselves into that um, uh, made us collaborate a lot with the engineers and the architects. Um, local roots and global mission, tension between those two things. This is about the humble, the integrated, the low key. Global mission is they're doing really inspired work and they need to help other people become more optimistic that we can solve really tough problems. The architects decided to make buildings that really represented the global mission, incongruent with the landscape, look like they come from outer space, like really grab people's attention. So we happily said, sure, we'll complement that with a ground that doesn't know the building's there. It's this naive, super quiet, integrated grid that's on the neighborhood grid. And it's sort of like it doesn't know that the buildings came from outer space. So then when you're in the campus, you move through something that really feels like it's authentic local ground, and it's almost like you get in a vehicle when you get into the buildings and climb up in them and float um, to get that larger perspective. Sometimes when we work with architects, this seems very non-integrated, but sometimes this is the way to go, is really try to complement each other with really different systems. And it's surprisingly difficult to be, to be uncoordinated in a deliberate way. So this is our layered thing. We have this green Hershey bar. Um, NBBJ agreed to take their lower podium buildings and rather than making these sort of boomerang buildings go all the way down to the street, which would have been not very friendly feeling for a street wall, they took the lower podium buildings, they have green roofs on them, and they provide a street wall that follows the street in our grid. So the first floor of NBBJ's buildings are part of that chunky, what we kind of thought of as this like cut peat bog layer, um, and then the upper part act like they're separate buildings. That's the concept. Um, this is what it looks like in plan view. Uh, over three acres of extensive green roofs, sedum, but this whole thing is a roof. Um, and we tried to create a center of the campus with, with water. The client wanted water from the outset. It's water that's about conserving, it's collected rainwater, it's being treated slowed and released, so it's not an ostentatious, you know, sort of corporate um, looking rainwater feature. But the idea is that we almost took a square hole punch and created a hole, and then we laid this central crossing ground blanket that sort of floats on top of it. This is it without the trees. And there's this ritual that we wanted to make consistent between all the buildings that you cross over a bridge to get to this sort of solid ground that's really like moist and dense, densely planted and then you cross over a bridge to get to sort of away from your home place and get into that shared floating blanket thing. This is an inspirational image about the natural kind of landscape we were referencing. This is a bog kind of near Seattle. It has that kind of thick spongy edge if you've ever been around the edge of a bog. Um, and then a lot of times the water's black and that's an important tonality thing. There's, there's serious stuff being talked about at the foundation so we wanted to make sure the water was respectful. Um, so it was interesting how ecology and culture kind of merged together with that language. And then here's a drawing I did that, you know, these kinds of drawings we just refer to again and again, even though they're really simple, um, to sort of explain what our end goal is. And then here it is right after it was built. Um, again, this is all on rooftop. We um, had these native reeds. This is the um, boardwalk. The facilities... Um, folks at the foundation ended up deciding that the wood was going to be potentially a little too rough. And there were a couple people who got their um, high heels caught in the joints. So if you go there now, this wood is replaced with uh, concrete planks. And we're really lucky because the client included us in that process. It was um, painful, <laughs> um, but um, uh, and it was one of those things, the client, whoever is responsible for liability and maintaining needs to feel super confident about what's out there. So even if a decision was made with another group, sometimes it changes after something's built. So I'll just go through these images and then I'll stop and open it for questions. Um, concrete, we, did, we developed this custom form liner with our contractor. And it's actually only two form liners that we flip and flip and flip all over the site. Um, this is a diagram of the water. There's a million gallon cistern underneath that floating plaza that collects all the um, water on the site from the pedestrian surfaces. 
Um, some of it goes to toilets, toilet flushing inside the building, but a lot of it goes to irrigation and our rainwater gardens. And by the way, you don't get hardly any rain off of a green roof because they work so well. So you kind of have to decide, do we want to capture water or do we want to absorb it when you're deciding whether to do a green roof or not? Technical section. Um, and then, you know, it's growing in and, and um, there's a lot of hardscape on it, partly because it's a rooftop, partly because they have to host big events there. Um, but it's, it's starting to, to grow in. And we just really love working with concrete. And, um, but the detailing and the craftsmanship become super important when you're using modest materials like concrete. Edible plants to reflect the focus on humans at the foundation, as well as native plants like the big leaf maple, which is our incredible, crazy, big, um, huge uh, deciduous shade tree we have in Seattle. We only have one, unlike where you are. And in this central plaza, that's the International Toilet Technology Fair that's held on that central plaza. Um, it's super cool. Um, and uh, people compete to reinvent the toilet. It's been way too long since the toilet's been reinvented, according to Bill Gates. Um, so he's trying to help push it along. Um, and he's actually right. It's kind of astonishing if you look into it. And then the paving pattern is a, uh, is, uh, that was the most popular thing I said in the whole presentation. The, um, <laughs> The paving pattern is influenced by um, strip weaving, which is a kind of weaving where each person weaves a piece and then you put it together and you get this sort of larger textile. Um, so you can kind of see that here, it's quite subtle, but it's trying to get things down to that human scale even though we do have quite a bit of paving. And um, this was a place where we were told no one will ever walk there. No one hardly ever walked along this um, side of the street, but you know, it's your job, it's our job to see past people's limitations and what they can imagine. And if you believe it, you believe it, you imagine it, you, then you make it work and you just pretend like it's almost already there, it will happen and people will use it because they'll feel that confidence in your hand in the way you design the space. Um, and I just can't say that enough about retrofitting our cities and um, streets, that they need a fresh eye, they need people to believe in them, believe that people will want to walk and just simply um, be able to imagine people um, walking in a straight line across our intersections um, and being able to get to where they need to with as much expediency and efficiency and care as we have been at paying to um, the vehicle mode for the last few decades. So I think I'm pretty much gonna end it on that and open it up to questions. Sorry, I, I did go over a bit on my time. Okay, I'll repeat the questions. Start with that, I repeated that. Yes. I'm wondering, the public can access the entire Bill Gates campus, or can the public go through that whole campus for the Gates Foundation? No, in fact, um, the security program, if you see that wall, um, there is a serious security program. It's kind of like an embassy, surprisingly, there's a lot of people who have made threats to the foundation because they, um, some of their grantees do work in women's um, health and reproductive, um, access to reproductive programs in um, other countries. So um, uh, that was definitely in mind. The foundation wanted to make the campus as welcoming and accessible as possible. And in the entry court, there's a place where anyone can walk up and. Oddly, you're kind of on this diving board that goes halfway into the center of campus and you can see everything, but, um, but it, is, it is closed and you do have to go su to, through security uh, to, to get in. That's a kinetic, kinetic attack wall there, so, which have become pretty common. We try to, when we have a kinetic attack wall or a, a, you know, some kind of security wall, we try to design it into the landform and try to make it a positive edge for the streetscape especially if we have building setbacks like this where people really want to have a little more of an edge. So we try to make it into a positive, positive contributor to the streetscape. Any other questions? Yes. Um, would you talk about how like, you go through the plan selection process and how you decide whether a site is more like manicured or more of a vegetated, like messy build? Uh, well, I guess it depends on the project. We've done some projects where we just want a slab of green topography and then we'll do topiary. 
Um, and then sometimes we want something to just look like it's bursting at the seams with wild, you know, loose, cloudy texture. And I, I think it depends on, and a lot of times we do both. We'll have some plants that are kind of holding in the cloud um, and then other things that are really undefined. It depends on how much other hard, perfect stuff is already around. And if there's already a bunch of paving and hard, perfect architecture, we usually want to amp up the imperfection and variety in the planting so that there's, uh, it's not too sterile. Um, if, we're in a, if we're inserting something into a more wild and soft and disorganized environment, we'll probably be a little more potent and defined with the planting. We might do something that's more like topiary or more consistent with fewer plants so that there's this moment of clarity. And it also is a scale thing. If it's a tiny little landscape. That's, <coughs> we're doing a planter that's like this big. We'll probably just use one plant, maybe two. And if it's huge, we're not going to do that to people. So, yes? So uh, earlier you mentioned that you were very young when you uh, partnered with two others, right? And yes. You, um, so along the, throughout the years, something has united you um, to stay together, right? You're still together. <laughs> and um, I'm wondering what, what, what's common between the three of you that has kept you together, and then also what has kept you together because you are different. That's, that's great. And I'm sorry that I already forgot to repeat questions in the last, um, so that's why you've been reminding me so much, because people forget or you knew I was going to. Um, the, um, by the way, the previous question was how do you decide whether you do highly defined planting or more wild planting. Um, so this question was what is it between the three of us that allows us to stay together or what's sort of our shared um, thing. We've talked about that quite a bit, and it's basically, you know, I think the number one thing is we, all three of us care so much. We will not drop the ball on something. So we really trust each other, and we care more, like Jennifer and Catherine care way more about this than pretty much anyone I've encountered, you know. I mean, I have encountered other people that care um, as much, but uh, for some reason that just was just you know, whoa, I want to work, I want to work with you. Um, and then there's just a sense of trust. So that's the most important thing. And um, is that sense of dedication and ultimate, like just taking complete responsibility to make sure that we're doing a really dang good job on something and not caring about the, not caring um, about where people normally stop or what's normally expected of landscape architects. We just want to do really good job on everything. And then I'd say secondarily, there's a commitment to um, integration. Um, and I'm, what I mean by that, the thing we all three have in common is we um, get as much information as we can about the site and then build as much function in. And then we just combine, 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 and see if we can figure out, like, is there one form or one surface that can serve all those purposes rather than um, adding too many different objects or layers in there. And if we can warp and warp and integrate, we'll come up with this sort of strange topography that serves all of those surfaces and it's unique to that project. So that I would say we share in common. And I think you kind of asked a sub-question at the What was the, could you um, remind me? Well, what, what, you're, you're three individuals, so you have differences. And yes. That, and that also is you not Yes, so that's really true. Um, the three of us have differences. Um, our personalities are different. Jennifer's from Orange County. She's like the nicest person you'll ever meet. Um, not saying that I'm terrible, but um, Jennifer's, <laughs> Jennifer's very um, just lovely and like socially at ease and um, she's sort of an optimist. I'm really a pessimist and I'm always like seeing like just, I'm almost motivated by fear of not of messing up and Jennifer's more motivated by joy. And I'd say Catherine is very much motivated by ambition and um, vision and um, somehow the th somehow it sometimes gets us to the same place but I think you do need differences between you and different kind of roles you're willing to play especially when the firm is small. Jennifer has handled a lot of the business management in the office over the years and um, has kind of become like this expert CEO business person <laughs> um, by necessity. Um, but then she's also been, especially lately, she's really been returning to design. She's a great designer. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. What's your favorite part about the work that you do? My favorite part about the work I do is learning about new places. Because I wasn't very, I didn't travel very much when I was young. 
And boy, every single place I go is just blows me away by how interesting it is. And it just makes me so frustrated that I can't retrain myself not to imagine places as dots on the map before I get there. Um, but especially, gosh, there's so much history in American City, so much beauty here. And everywhere I go, people are just so interesting to work with, so much to be learned. So that's definitely my favorite part of the job is learning about a new place, panicking, and then like, oh, I gotta learn about this place or learn about this, these people. Um, and then feeling like, oh, I feel like I'm kind of getting the sense of this place. And then I always wanna move to the places we're working in, <laughs> um, which doesn't pan out, but. Yes. Um, when you do this, um, how do you get over that? Like how do you get past the road block? When, do I, when I get, to s get stressed, how do I get over it? Um, I bury myself in, it's probably the opposite. It's the opposite of what Jennifer does. <laughs> um, but I, I just dig in deeper. And um, I, if I can get an hour or two of time, just sitting, sometimes just sitting down with a pencil and redrawing the design, even if I know I'm stuck on something and it's not working, I'll carefully, I'll draft every aspect of the design with a scale. And there's something about redoing that. It makes me feel in control again. Reminds me to look again at all the lines. And somehow that'll push things forward. And it's almost like turning my brain off so I'm not trying to solve the problem. But I'm like, I'm going to just dumbly redraft this for a little bit. And somehow that helps. There was a question back there. And then, and then you're next because I'm sorry. Yes? Um, yeah, you often show like uh, very uh, expansive landscapes where you're kind of breaking down the scale. Um, do you ever come across opportunity or uh, sort of situations where you're forced to, um, um, where you're limited to your size, where maybe you can't expand the sidewalk and expand the standard scale? How, how do you that? So how do we deal when um, our site is smaller than our <coughs> ideas are? Um, we encounter that on every single project. And um, sometimes we get lucky and, and the, ci the city or the agency or the client will hire us to do a master plan because they see that by trying to figure out how to solve the site, we have really gotten excited about the whole neighborhood or some like, oh, did you know this street used to do this? And um, sometimes it, it solves itself. Um, we, we have learned over the years not to go beyond our to know when it's like, look, this isn't your client's property. So you can um, come up with that. It's surprising how much, though, when you come up with the ideas, it's like, well, you know, if you did the other side of the street, too, some, it, sometimes people are just like, oh, I never thought of that. That would be better. And people will figure out some way to do it. But um, we have gotten better in recent years about, I guess, um, speaking differently and knowing when to stop focusing on something outside of our scope boundary um, and you know, making sure we're really solving the things within our scope boundary so they can stand alone. And maybe, maybe what we end up doing is like making sure we at least don't preclude with whatever work we do within our little boundary. We make sure that we're setting it up so that we're not precluding somebody to come in later and make the street two-sided or you know, make something continue across the crosswalk. And um, it's kind of master planning by precedent piece or something. Um, but it's, it's kind of frustrating, but it's just part of the job if you're really trying to connect things into the context. Yes? So there, there were several points in this talk where you described your, your build works and your design works as bodies. That, that was like pretty interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about what that sense of the design as a body means for your practice? Like, is it about mm -hmm. aging or something else? Is it about which? Aging. Aging. <laughs> Interesting question to ask us at, our, at this juncture in our career. Um, so that, so um, the, the reference to the work as bodies, um, I, it is sort of a, um, it is a, um, I guess, sort of peculiar. I think the reason why I use that word is it's a way to convey this idea that this isn't just a, a bunch of pieces. It's a solid mass, like the ground is part of the earth. We're a surface of a, of a um, volume. And a body, you know, you don't just like take a piece of a body off. It's, it's something that, it's this complex series of surfaces and it has different features, but it's all connected. And it's this outer surface of a, of a solid system. So there's something about describing a piece of land like that, that 
helps kind of turn it into a complete being <laughs> or something. Um, and it's a little bit strategic that when I use that word, um, it's saying that there's a form that needs to be recognized independent of the, surf, the textures and, and pieces of it. Um, I guess that's the best I could do. I'll also admit that Catherine taught me, you know, when I first started working with her, that if you're stuck about how to blend features together and not to do it in a cartoonish or obvious way using like a perfect art, like don't, you know, instead of using a perfect art, look at the way that bodies handle some of these transitions and contours. There might be an articulation at an elbow or a shoulder and they're really not perfect and, you know, they're not simple geometries but they're sort of familiar and they're often, um, if you're just saying, oh, I'm gonna design something beautiful, you know, the shape of whether it's a human body or another feature in nature, um, there's that imperfect life to it that you feel like you're seeing an excerpt of something that has a bigger function and so it feels a little more interesting. So I guess allowing that imperfect hand <coughs> to be in there. So there's probably a little bit of true reference to body. Yes. Um, so obviously GGN has done some pretty spectacular work. Thank um, you. I mean, you know, we in our classes study a lot of the stuff you guys do. And so my question is, are these typical? I mean, like, I mean, like, is it like every day you're working on a Lurie Garden type project? Or I mean, are there more boring projects? <laughs> well, um, so um, are these projects typical of our work and how much of it's boring? Um, <laughs> No, that's a really important question to ask everybody who comes lecture comes in lectures. Uh, we're we have been really lucky that we've almost always had one or two of these projects. You know, that are going like I, I've been the projects I showed here have been pretty much a constant um, sort of storyboard of work. But I was talking to some folks earlier that um, and actually. I have to admit there was one more project I was going to show after this that was a street master plan that some people would think is boring, um, but it kind of represented this other category of work that we do a lot of. And it's basically, most of it's in the Seattle area because we couldn't afford to travel and make it pencil out to do these things in other cities. But they're often sidewalks for developers. So there'll be a mixed use development that goes in and you, you all are going to be working on a lot of these projects. But we love these projects. We work on them because we love them. So a mixed use project's going in and there's a piece of sidewalk in front of it and maybe there's a tiny little setback at the entry. Um, but what we love doing on those projects is engaging in the street, helping to fight the battle with the review boards that always want some special paving in the sidewalk rather than paving that acknowledges the public continuity of that street um, language. So we're often arguing for less. So it's almost like you know some of our architect friends laugh because they feel like they're bringing in these kind of heavy hitter, like they kind of think, well, we're bringing in these heavy hitters to basically go argue for normal concrete sidewalks to go in. But it takes a lot of, um, co I guess, confidence to argue for that. And we learn a lot with those projects. We have wonderful, so for instance, Foster and Partners and LMN and MBBJ, um, Olson Kundig, we work with a lot. Wonderful architecture firm friends. And we work on these you know, really big projects with them, but then we've developed these friendships and they'll say, well, can you work on this with us? And we'll just do that because we have a great rapport. And I find that, and I was gonna emphasize that a little more in the talk, um, about half of our work is sub to architects. And I love that work. Um, I get to know way more designers than any architects I know does know. They don't know each other because they aren't working with each other on projects. And I get to learn from all those firms, see how they handle design review, see how they handle quality control, see how they prep for presentations. It's just like the best of both worlds um, getting to, to collaborate. But it means you do have, you know, you have these projects you work on that, um, you know, might not photograph very well. I wouldn't say they're boring, but um, they're not as glamorous um, to show in a lecture as some of the projects I showed here. Sorry, I took too long answering that. Some <coughs> yeah, um, I, was, uh, I was wondering if uh, 
Well, I imagine you take part in a lot of uh, competitions, and maybe you don't win all of them. So, is, do you recycle some of those ideas and concepts <laughs> you don't win and use them somewhere else? Or maybe like a part of a, I don't know, like your design, the iterative process that didn't work out, and maybe you recycle that idea somewhere else. Can you talk a little bit about that? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so, do we reuse the ideas that don't win in competitions? There's kind of two parts of that question. One is that we've become extremely judicious about what competitions we enter because we've won a string of really prominent competitions um, where they didn't turn into projects. And competitions have become sort of a PR. Like, you know, there's firms now that specialize in telling people who have prospective projects that need to raise money, hey, I'll hold a competition for you. This will get so much press. You know, you'll get all these free graphics of what this could be but there's really not a plan to move forward with it yet, and it's sort of abusive of um, designers. And we're, you know, we take the bait pretty easily because we're like, oh, I'd love to get my hands on, you know, the National Mall or whatever. But um, we become much more judicious. With that said, for projects where we haven't won competitions, I can't think of one example where we were able to reuse um, anything we've done for a competition other than developing camaraderie with our collaborators. So sometimes we've done competitions with architects and, you know, they're, they just wear you out. So you develop that kind of loopy camaraderie that sometimes you get late night in studio where just people are so tired. And, um, and that's actually valuable. Um, recently, we entered a, uh, there was an auction, charity auction in Seattle where um, different design firms were asked to decorate chairs, the Eames rocker chairs. And, I was like, I know just the thing we're going to put on it. We're going to put our Volker Park competition losing graphic on this chair because it was one of my favorite graphics we've ever done as a firm. But it was like this spectacular sunset um, graphic that almost became a joke in the firm because it was so melodramatic and beautiful and it was the sun going down and we lost the competition. So we, uh, <laughs> we just like put it square. We lay, like, had, it, um, had, it, had the chair, um, you know, one of those graphic decal companies put that on the chair, it was spectacular. And it was sort of an inside joke in our firm, but um, apparently the chair was really popular in the auction. So um, that's the only thing I can think of, which is sort of <laughs> trivial, <laughs> but it's true. Yes? Uh, earlier you mentioned it, uh, just like sketching on small sheets of paper in order to get your big ideas out. And eventually that, or through your projects, it's really it's simple and elegant. And I'm just kind of curious if you use any other techniques or you're not dressing up design anymore. And you're, I guess, how do you know when you have just the right amount of design to get that simple elegance? Mm. That's, yeah, that's almost a conversation. So how do you know, I think you guys could hear him, but how do you know when you get the right amount of design uh, or sort of like right level of design and you sort of stop and you have that, it's sort of done, so to speak, um, and you don't need to mess with it anymore. Uh, I think that, needs, that question needs to be constantly asked through a project, because there's a moment, I always get to a moment, depending on where we are, so if it's in the beginning of the project, there's just a moment where you feel like you've gotten the bone structure right, I guess that, you know, that body, um, that basic body morphology comes in, and that feels so finished to me when, when I get it done, you know, or when we get it done as a group. And I'll be so satisfied with that. But you do need to ask that question again when you're at another level of detail. Or it could be too minimalist. There could be not a, we aren't um, messing it up enough. And I'd say that we've probably, um, we're always in more, maybe in more danger of that than we are in, because we've got that down pat, like sticking to the idea. And um, we're probably in more danger of forgetting to ask that question and mucking it up a little more. What kind of materials do you know to choose, I guess, once you have that, that design, I guess, yeah. from moving from you know, to the detail? It's based, how do we choose materials is based on a, com a combination of the concept, what's the story we're telling of the site. So it very may well be that the site used to be a mill or a marsh or um, a campus or whatever. There's always a richness of influences. Um, that are coming from that direction. And then there's the experience we want the body to have. 
Do we want it to feel like you're moving through hard, sort of precise volume of space? Or do we want you to feel like you're sort of floating through a cloud? And that, that has a huge, you know, that sort of experiential and sensory. And then the last thing is composi I mean, composition. Does it look too, you know, is it, do we need more stimulation, more variety, compositional and scale? Well, I, uh, I think those last couple of questions were so deep that folks might, she said, might take a conversation, so. <laughs> I'm always in danger of that. <laughs> uh, Shannon, I want to thank you for a, a really, really great lecture. Um, and before we clap, I also want to thank the students and faculty, and the students I really want to point out for really great questions. Thanks for, yeah. for being a part of this and being a part of the, well, that's my favorite term, a, a loopy camaraderie. <laughs> um, and and uh, also, I want to thank Jessica Canfield for uh, executing all this and, and, and thank you. here. So, really, really inspiring. Thank you very much. Thank you.